the, uh, the purpose that we're uh, um, looking at in the back of the screen there is, is the original one that we found here uh, over 17 years ago now. And so we'll talk about that discovery and what it means for this population of objects of still unknown origin uh, in, the, uh, in the distant universe, as it turns out. So uh, let's start at the radio sky. And um, hopefully this, um, um, this audio that I'll play in a minute will work. But uh, before we get to that, um, this what you're looking at here is the Green Bank Horizon. Um, so the telescopes at the Green Bank Observatory here in West Virginia. Uh, but then superposed over the sky, instead of an optical image, this is a five centimeter radio map of the sky. And so all of those points you see there, they're not stars, they are they're actually radio galaxies. Um, so nearby stars and stars in the Milky Way in general don't emit much in the radio. Our sun is the exception because it's so nearby, but the rest of the stars we, we kind of just don't see. And we see instead all of these distant galaxies. You also see some um, expand, extended objects. There's this supernova remnant here and, and these extended radio features here. Uh, these are galactic um, sources that are emitting radio waves as well. But it's a completely different picture um, and really complements what we can do uh, at other wavelengths. And to, uh, to take that uh, a step further, what we're going to be talking about tonight are this new population of radio sources that are transient in nature. That is, they come uh, and go within a few milliseconds. Uh, so you can think of them as radio flashes in the sky that are on top of this background of radio sources that we're looking at. These are very steady radio sources that are always there. Um, but what we're talking about are these transient signals. So let me just play them. Uh, what you're going to hear um, is the background noise of uh, in the electronics, which is coming from the sky and just the noise in the in the receiver system itself. Um, and then on top of that, you will hear some tones. So I'll let you listen to those. And I'll talk about it on the other side. Okay, so hopefully that, that worked and you, you could hear that background rumble and then you heard these chirps uh, on the top of that. Uh, and so that was a simulation, um, kind of speeded up a little bit, but roughly about once every 20 to 30 seconds somewhere on the sky, one of these bursts uh, appears. And so what you were hearing there in the audio was a translation of the radio signals such that you heard that the highest frequency uh, audio signal arrived first, and then it sort of it chirped, so such that the lowest frequency signal uh, arrived later, and that's the phenomenon. Whoop, let me just. That's the phenomenon that we're uh, we're observing in the radio, and so here's a graph of that. Um, so here's the original signal that we found, and so what you're looking at is radio frequency versus time, and if you look at the um, the time um, axis here, there's only um, half a second of data um, that we're looking at here. So it's just a very a small snapshot. And here's the pulse. So this is the that you were hearing um, just a moment ago. And so the, hi the highest frequency signal arrives first, and the lowest frequency component arrives later. Uh, I often at this point get my uh, West Virginia driver's license out uh, just to uh, highlight something related to this. Hopefully I'm carrying my dr West Virginia driver's license. Oh, here it is. So if you look on the back of your driver's license, you have something that has this uh, black and white code, which looks very similar to the, uh, to the black and white uh, background uh, in this radio observation. And this is this is actually the simplest possible digitization of the radio signal that we do. It's, like it's either a zero or a one, whether it's uh, higher or lower than some average level. Uh, and so that's the, all the background noise. And all these ones here, these black points, that's the signal that's, that's, that's picking up on it. And then this, this thing here is a malfunctioning 
frequency channel. Um, when you add up the pulse along this line, uh, you get the what's called the, the de-dispersed pulse. You take out this dispersion effect uh, and you see this narrow pulse, which is basically just adding along this track here and then you're plotting against over half a second of, of time there. And so you see this narrow pulse uh, and that's what, we, uh, that's what we observed. So what's happening, what's, what's this dispersion that I'm talking about? Well, it's not actually intrinsic to the source. That is that the source itself emits all of the frequencies essentially at the same time. So it, it emits this broadband radio signal over all frequencies. But then as the signals travel across um, space, um, they actually interact with um, free electrons that are um, just occupying various parts of, of space. Uh, so in the Milky Way, we have free electrons um, that are concentrated along the, the disk of the Milky Way. Um, those are coming from star forming regions, from supernova explosions and things like that. Uh, and then and what those electrons do is that they um, they act as uh, kind of like a prism uh, on the radio signal and they slow down the lower frequency signals relative to the higher frequency ones. So these higher frequency radio waves at the top here travel fastest and arrive first compared to the lower frequency ones that arrive later. And so we talk about this dispersion uh, being essentially proportional to the number of free electrons in between us and the source. So the farther away a source is, the more electrons it will interact with and the greater this delay is. So this, this, uh, the delay here is actually telling us something about the distance to the source. So it's really, it's not an intrinsic uh, property, but it's telling us how it, how it traveled uh, to us. So it's really important. Um, and so I'll, and I'll come back to that in a, in a few moments, but that's the big picture. Um, some of you may be from more familiar with radio telescopes than others. Uh, so let me show you a couple of my favorite dishes. Um, and here is the, the, the radio telescope in Parks where we made the initial discovery. And you can see there, it's, it's just a beautiful instrument. It's a 64 meter diameter dish. Um, sitting in uh, farming country in New South Wales, Australia. It's about 250 kilometers from Sydney. Um, just a beautiful area, very quiet. Um, and this telescope has been around since the early 60s. And because it sees the whole southern sky, it sees it's been really uh, kind of unparalleled for many years in, in the sources that it can see. It's been amazing for searching for pulsars, which is what I've spent a lot of my career doing, because you can see the center of the Milky Way and the inner galaxy much better than you can from here in the Northern Hemisphere. So it has a really good view of the, the galaxy. Um, but it's also in a very radio quiet environment, uh, which is also very nice because that um, stops us from getting false alarms, although we will talk about one of those shortly. Um, now, to understand how we got to fast radio bursts, you, you have to go back in time um, and just briefly look at some of the some of the early radio telescopes. So this one here in Cambridge in the UK was used by Jocelyn Bell um, as part of her PhD thesis to look for um, <coughs> to look for twinkling of radio sources in the radio sky, kind of analogous to the twinkling of optical light in the atmosphere. Um, in the radio sky, we the, the uh, the twinkling of the radio signal is coming from not, not our atmosphere, but actually the interplanetary medium. So the ionized medium um, around the solar system is um, particularly um, prevalent at certain wavelengths. Uh, and this telescope was actually used uh, looking at the in the FM bands around about 100 megahertz. Uh, and it was surveying the sky. Uh, day after day, uh, as it passed overhead, the telescope didn't move. It's just the, 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 sky, the sources in the sky moved as the Earth rotated. And so Jocelyn Bell, who's pictured here, very famously discovered the first pulsar using this instrument. Um, and, um, he, and she literally analyzed miles of these pen chart recordings, which are just recording the intensity from the telescope versus time. And so what happens is, 
as the as sources come into the field of view of the telescope, they appear on the pen chart recorder. And those sources can be nearby, um, terrestrial interference, uh, and they can also, more interestingly, be more distant celestial sources. So here's an example of some interference that, that she often saw, and this was from badly suppressed um, uh, electrical devices. Um, but then she saw this, um, the first of what would be a family of signals um, that was appearing at the same point in the sky virtually night after night. And so she realized that it was something celestial in origin. It wasn't just some random, randomly occurring um, source of interference. And when she zoomed in on this, so this is a, a few seconds of data here, but when she zoomed in on this uh, recording and, and set the pen chart recorder to run much more rapidly, she was able to resolve these individual pulses. And these are spaced by about one second uh, in time um, here. And you can see these, uh, these individual pulses um, from what we now know uh, uh, these sources as pulsars. Um, and so that's an amazing story. And, and of course, one that I'm sure you've uh, heard about at, at these meetings and, and read about and, and, and know quite a bit about. Um, it's very important to us because um, most of us that are in the fast radio burst community started out by studying pulsars. Um, now, I was barely alive when this, this pulsar was discovered, but um, it was an amazing discovery back then in 1968. Um, the first pulsar in the Crab Nebula it, the, the, to be associated with a supernova remnant was found. And so the pulsar in the Crab Nebula kind of solidified this idea that rotating neutron stars, which are formed uh, in supernova explosions, can, can produce these, uh, these radio pulses that we see. And the idea is that the, the pulsar is spinning and it sends out this beam of radiation that flashes past our line of sight, uh, rather like a lighthouse. What was remarkable about the crab pulsar was that it was actually discovered through its so-called giant pulses. It was discovered at first at the Green Bank Observatory uh, and then later confirmed at Arecibo. But at Green Bank, they just saw these bright um, um, pulses that were didn't really have an obvious periodicity associated with them. And you can this artist's impression here kind of shows, you know, a train of radio data coming from the center of the, um, the nebula and these bright pulses were uh, superposed on that. It later turned out to have a very um, compelling periodicity, and so it was, it was realized that the star was rotating uh, with a period of 33 milliseconds, but most of those pulses are buried in the noise, and what you're seeing here are bright individual so-called giant pulses. That got people really excited um, because they realized that these types of sources could be seen not only within the Milky Way, which is where pulsars are predominantly observed, but well beyond the Milky Way. And that's because these pulses are so bright that they can be seen uh, out into the distant universe. And so what we now understand as fast radio bursts really began in the, in the 1970s. People started st searching for what we now know as fast radio bursts. Uh, and so there's a number of important figures that I'll, I'll just mention, you know, very, very briefly here. You know, um, people were, were talking about um, this idea, you know, as in the early 1970s. People started doing the first searches. John Jelly was one of the first uh, astronomers to do that, to actually search uh, with a radio telescope for individual pulses. People back then were thinking they could maybe come from supernova explosions or be, um, be supercharged giant pulses. And then there was also a lot of theoretical work going on to think about how these sources, if they were found, if they could be found and identified, how they could be used to map out the, um, the intergalactic um, uh, the content of inter intergalactic space in the same way that people were using the pulsars to map out the free electrons in the Milky Way, people were realizing that they could uh, look at free electrons across the universe. So that was really exciting. Um, people started thinking about different uh, types of sources. So uh, Martin Rees and Stephen Hawking wrote papers about exploding black holes uh, through Hawking's famous uh, radiation process, and that was another source of of potentially bright pulses. More people started looking. 
Stelthini and Joe Taylor uh, were one of the uh, early searches. Um, there was there were reports of of some dispersed pulses um, by uh, by this person here, Ivan Linscott, in the early 1980s, but they were never confirmed, and that was coming from M87. Um, and so this this uh, this field went kind of dormant for a while uh, until people picked it up in the late 1990s, early 2000s. So Maura McLaughlin, my wife, um, and her at the time. PhD advisor Jim Cordes uh, at Cornell University and another graduate student, Shami Chatterjee, started to um, kind of reinvigorate this field and come up with um, modern algorithms to look for these dispersed pulses. So no, no longer now do we look through miles and miles of pen chart recordings. Instead, we use a computer to analyze the data more carefully and look for dispersed pulses. And this is an example of some search code. Um, so this quantity going on the vertical axis is dispersion measure. And so that's proportional to the delay that you saw in that earlier plot. So that's you can basically think of this axis as distance going on on the vertical axis. And I haven't labeled the, <laughs> the horizontal axis like a really bad student. Um, this is time going along the horizontal axis. Um, so you've got uh, just over half an hour of data there. It's 2,000 seconds. And what you see, I hope, are three fairly bright uh, pulses above this background noise. So these big symbols, those are significant pulses that the code has detected. Uh, this turns out to be um, a new phenomenon. Um, there's a paper that Mora led um, in 2006 where she looked at data that from the Parkes telescope uh, that was looking in the disk of the Milky Way and identified a number of radio bursts uh, from what turns out to be also rotating neutron stars. And so they're kind of like sputtering pulsars that occasionally emit these pulses and then they, then they switch off. So that was really exciting. Um, but it also got us to think about uh, going further out. Um, and so Maura and I moved to West Virginia University in 2006, hard to believe now, it's 18 years ago. So the, the baby that we were holding there is now a senior in high school and he's gonna, he's also gonna be uh, coming to WVU in the fall. Um, and um, yeah, time really flies. But um, back then we were uh, really in, encouraged to, to work with students uh, and had, uh, you know, really wanted to hit, hit the ground running and, and get some new results. And so what we tended to do was to offer students uh, a fresh look at archival data sets. This was kind of the, the beginning of the era where it was be becoming possible to not only get access to data sets, but also reprocess them in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and so one of the things we did was we, um, we started looking at some data from the Magellanic Clouds, uh, which you can see here. Um, the large and the small ones, and we can't see them from the northern hemisphere. And I suspect many of you haven't seen them at all with your own eyes, but you're no doubt familiar with them. But I'm sure some of you have seen them. Uh, they are amazing objects in the southern sky. They're our nearest neighbor galaxies, um, uh, these uh, irregular galaxies that were already known to have um, pulsars in them. So, so just regular spinning pulsars were already known to be in those those objects. And so what we thought we would do is look for isolated pulses rather than just a continuous stream of pulses. We would use this code to analyze the data in a new way. And so uh, I enlisted the um, the help of a student here, Ash Narkovic, who's pictured here, uh, with the pulse that we found. Um, and we were looking through data sets like this one here, where you've got dispersion measure. So again, think about this as distance versus time. And uh, these uh, individual pulses that you see uh, along the line here, these are coming from, as it turns out, this is a, a known pulsar in the Magellanic Cloud. And we see enough individual pulses to identify it to, a, to an already known source. So that was good. It meant, meant that the code was working. Um, but then Ash came upon a uh, rather unexpected signal um, that you can see on the top right here. So it's highly localized. So the pulse is strongest here at a dispersion measure of 375 in these units. Um, 
And it turns out to have a much greater dispersion measure than the, the already known pulsars in the Magellanic clouds. And so that was already suspicious. But then when we went and looked at where this, um, um, this observation was pointing, we noticed that it was actually um, to the south whoops, uh, of the, um, the small Magellanic cloud. So you can see the small Magellanic cloud here. And these 13 circles here, these are the pixels that our receiver um, observes on the sky. So we have, you know, your phone has millions of pixels. We have 13 on this telescope. So we can look at 13 positions on the sky at once. Uh, and these little marks inside the circles here show the detections of the, uh, the source that we found. And it was actually somewhere in between these three, probably over here. But nevertheless, it's like two degrees south of the small Magellanic cloud. And it has a much greater dispersion than we would have expected from the Milky Way. And it wasn't even pointing in the, you know, exactly at the Magellanic cloud. Basically what we were dealing with is a signal that we were looking in a sight line across the universe. Uh, and so we were um, really looking at something brand new. And so we got very excited about this. Um, there's the pulse again that we saw. Um, we went back to that same spot in the sky <coughs> with, the, with the Parkes telescope and observed it for over 90 hours. Did not see any more um, repetitions, uh, any, any further pulses. But nevertheless, we'd really convinced ourselves and done a number of checks um, to, to make it what we thought was a compelling case for this highly dispersed pulse uh, also being very distant. And we estimated um, its distance um, from what we you know, thought we knew about the electrons in the universe. Uh, and that comes to something like three, three billion light years uh, from the Earth. And so this was something that was very, very distant uh, and therefore very, very bright. Uh, something like a trillion times more luminous than these giant pulses from the crab that people had seen. Uh, in the early days of pulsar astronomy. Uh, it's a lot of energy. It's putting out what the sun puts out in a month, it puts out in a few milliseconds. So it was something entirely new. Uh, this, uh, and it, not only was it just one object, we, we made a case for the fact that it really was the prototype of a new class. And the reason we could do that was because the telescopes only see a small fraction of the sky at a given time. And so when we extrapolate to the rest of the sky and say, we saw this one pulse in this many hours with this field of view, we um, could show that um, it's equivalent to several hundred of them going off each day across the whole sky. So that was super exciting. Um, and we really, um, we really um, were, were very, very pleased with this result and started, started to follow up its implications. The, um, the picture that we that I like people to have in their mind's eye when they think about this is that you know we're over here somewhere in the Milky Way, the what we now call it <coughs> as a fast radio burst, uh, this pulse um, originated in let's say a distant galaxy, and it traveled across the universe for three billion years um, to get to um, to us, uh, and so it crossed not only the electrons in its host galaxy, but there were, maybe it passed through an intervening galaxy and then the electrons in the Milky Way as well. So what you're seeing down here is um, a kind of a, a snapshot of the, the pulse as it might have looked throughout its journey. So when it was generated, we think all of the pulses were emitted at the same time. And so that's this vertical line here. Um, now, when it uh, leaves the host galaxy, it picks up a bit of dispersion there. And so it gets, you can see it's getting a little bit delayed, but then it travels for the next 3 billion years <laughs> across the universe. Uh, and then it picks up most of um, the dispersion uh, there. It then travels through the Milky Way for the last 30,000 years or so before this particular one arrived at the Parkes Telescope on July 24th, 2001. Um, you know, it's just a remarkable. So I often think of these um, these little uh, imprints here as kind of like stamps on a passport. You know, as you go to, to different countries, you get your passport stamped. 
what's happening here you know, is as the pulse has traveled across the universe, we, it's had its kind of passport stamped by the free electrons. Uh, and we, we see that in the information that it presents us. Um, so it's really an, it's really an interesting um, uh, thing to consider. Um, of course, you're all wondering what could it be? Uh, very energetic, um, and but also something very small. And that's because the pulse was a very had a very narrow width. It was only a few milliseconds in duration. So what that means is it couldn't be something like a galaxy, which is 100,000 light years in size. It had to be something that was a few light milliseconds in size. So something like on the surface of a star or a compact star itself, uh, something very small and very energetic. Um, now, when you work out how much energy there that gets released, it's a, it, it's a lot, but it's not, it's not, not uh, so great that you have to make up some new type of source. So some of the early theories that are still popular are that it could be a, a giant uh, radio flare from a magnetar, a highly magnetized neutron star, and we know that those exist. Um, it could also be an electromagnetic signal from a supernova, or it could be the coalescence of uh, two, um, two stars. Uh, all of those scenarios release enough energy, but we just we still don't know yet what they are. By this point, um, fast radio bursts, they hadn't quite got named as such. Um, they were named after me. <laughs> uh, so this, this, this original one was called the Lorimer Burst. Uh, and it's that particular pulse has kind of slowly made its way into uh, into a popular psyche. There's a book about relationships that has the story, part of the story of the discovery in there that you might want to check out. Uh, and there's also, for those of you who like music, there's a post-rock uh, German instrumental band called Lorimer Burst. And, <laughs> and they have an album out called Dispersion. Uh, so you can check them out if you if you are interested. But um, really, we still, it took a long time for us to, um, to really understand what they were. Uh, and part of the, uh, the story was that um, as people started looking for more examples of these, as you naturally do as a scientist, when, you, when you're presented with a new phenomenon, you want to go and look for more examples. Many people did this. And some examples were found. <coughs> um, there were there were these things that kind of looked like the original uh, the original burst, but they had much they had a different structure, um, and they also looked like um, they were coming in into all thirteen beams of the of the telescope's field of view, and so that's something that's not what you expect for an astronomical source. This what what people were finding here looked much more. Uh, like some sort of local phenomenon, probably an interfering source. Um, they were dubbed, and people, so people realized that at the time, and so they were dubbed the peritons, named after this Greek, mythical Greek elk that casts a human shadow. So it's something that's masquerading as an astrophysical source in this case, but it's not actually that. And, uh, Sarah Books Belair was uh, one of the first people to really um, establish this, and Sarah is now a faculty member here at WVU. Um, by 2013, though, um, there were enough um, discoveries um, made that there were a number of, of convincing sources that were different from these peritons. And that's, that's shown here on these graphics. Um, what you're looking at on the left here is dispersion measures. So th again, think distance on the y-axis. And then uh, on the x-axis is galactic latitude. So that's the angle bit off the galactic plane. Um, here's the original source that we found. There was another one over here, and then there were these four new sources that were found by this group um, that's, uh, that's shown here. Uh, and this was a survey of the, the sky that was specifically designed to look for, for these types of things. You can see that the, all of them are very different from the radio pulsars, which are these red points uh, in the background here. And this is the dispersion that you get from the Milky Way. Um, and so these are clearly an anomalous population. Um, and so what could they be? Um, and you still might be asking, well, what are the peritons? Um, you know, how, what, how did we figure out what they were? 
or they they turn out to be. It turns out um, that when you when you make a graph of the peritons, the number of peritons found versus time, they all peak rather mysteriously around lunchtime. Um, and so this is uh, around midday. What it what it what they actually have uh, are are radio signals that are emitted from microwave ovens that are used most prominently around lunchtime in the visitor center, which is next to the telescope. So here's a little uh, um, movie, a, a couple of stills from a movie showing uh, showing an experiment that they did where they opened this, the the door, uh, and then in the uh, on the other end of a phone line, someone in the in the uh, at the telescope could see that this emitted a pulse that was detected, and so it was there was a clear cause and effect that was found. This didn't actually wasn't established until 2015, so it took a lot of detective work by Emily Petrov that's shown here um, to to come to that. Emily is now um, a researcher working in Canada. Um, and so then the um, the intervening time was uh, filled with lots of uh, excitement uh, since then. Um, in 2016, the first fast radio burst that repeats uh, was found. So now that we had, you know, we, we had more examples of them, we didn't just have one source, uh, we had a population of them. Now is the question is, you know, what are they and do they re repeat? And it turns out that some of them do. About 10% of, of the ones that we currently know repeat. Um, and uh, Laura Spittler found the first one, Laura shown here, this was, uh, this was in data taken with the Arecibo telescope. Um, and this um, was a number of a repeat bursts with the same dispersion characteristics coming from the same patch in the sky, very, but very sporadic. Um, they didn't seem, there wasn't a clear periodicity and, and they, they, they um, but there were multiple pulses. And so what that meant was it couldn't be something like supernova explosion or a coalescence event, which would only happen once. It would have to be some sort of recurring phenomenon, perhaps like some sort of uh, um, some variant of the, the giant pulse uh, phenomenon or, or some other scenario. So that was an interesting breakthrough uh, already eight years ago. Um, and um, the year after that, uh, Shami Chatterjee, that the graduate student that you saw in the picture earlier, uh, by that time was um, um, an expert in using this um, this instrument here, the very large array in New Mexico, and this was this was significant because once you found once Laura had found that initial repeating source, then um, astronomers could point uh, an interferometer, this collection of radio telescopes, at that position in the sky. And the beauty of the interferometer is that it synthesizes a much greater dish than the size of the individual ones. And so that means that it can resolve very small um, regions on the sky, uh, small enough um, once, they, once they saw repeats with the VLA to see, um, to pinpoint it to, uh, to a host galaxy. Um, so this was a huge breakthrough um, because before that we really didn't know we didn't have enough resolution with the with the original uh, telescopes um, to pinpoint them, and so here, knowing that it came from this galaxy, <laughs> which turns out to be at a distance of 2.3 billion light years, proved that these um, FRBs were cosmological in origin. So for the first time, we had a direct measurement um, of the distance, um, and then things started accelerating from there in 2019. Um, this telescope in Canada uh, came online. Uh, it's called CHIME, which stands for Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. It's also a transit telescope like Jocelyn Bell's that scans the sky every day, but it's much more powerful. Um, it, it can resolve um, a, a large swath of the sky and track sources uh, as it passes through the telescope's field of view. Uh, with very high sensitivity um, and such that it can detect now <coughs> about three fast radio bursts every day. It has enough, it has enough uh, field of view to see them. Um, and so it's been finding a lot of interesting uh, sources. One is in a nearby spiral galaxy, uh, very low redshift, only 170 uh, megaparsecs away. Uh, one is in a, a globular cluster in, in uh, 
an object that would be familiar to many of you, M81. So it's one of M81's globular clusters. So that's interesting because globular clusters, as you probably know, are regions where there is very little star formation going on. And um, that means that um, unlike the um, spiral galaxies where there are young stars that could produce these magnetars, it's much more challenging to produce a magnetar in a globular cluster because magnetars are not very long-lived objects. Um, so that's a, that's a puzzle that is ongoing as to why some FRBs are in globular clusters. And then really uh, the CHIME uh, experiment just kind of opened the floodgates. Up until, this, up until about 2018, we only knew of about 30 fast radio bursts, whereas now we know of um, several hundreds, uh, actually a couple of thousand that are, that are not fully published yet. And this is thanks largely to the, um, to the work of CHIME. And one of the interesting things that they've seen, because they are looking at the same the sky day after day, they're able to see repeat FRBs. Uh, and then so far they've identified about 50 of them. Um, they, like I said, about 10% of all of the FRBs seem to repeat as far as Chime can see. Um, and not only do they, uh, do they definitely repeat, they have a different uh, characteristic. The ones that we see only once tend to be broadband. This is the frequency versus time. And they have a simple structure. Whereas the repeating ones are these three examples over here. They tend to be narrowband signals with more complex morphology, which makes the pulses broader. And so the repeaters uh, are, um, are broader in width, but they don't occupy as much of the frequency spectrum uh, as the one-offs uh, sources. So this is, uh, this is an emerging picture um, that we are uh, still learning about. 2020 was a, you know, a horrible year in many ways. Um, there was a lot of um, breakthroughs in fast radio bursts, however. Uh, and one of them was the discovery of what looks like an FRB pulse from a magnetar. Um, so remember, these are highly magnetized neutron stars. This was a magnetar in our Milky Way. Um, and it is well known, uh, this particular source, to emit X-ray bursts. Um, and then what, uh, what CHIME saw, and also this, uh, this very small uh, instrument here, STAIR-2, uh, also saw, these, here are the two detections, was a bright radio flare that was accompanying an X-ray flare from this magnetar. And so that was really a very um, exciting development because for the first time, it kind of gave a connection between a fast radio burst and a type of source. Um, and so not only do they seem to be going off in our Milky Way galaxy, now FRBs seem to be um, pretty much um, visible you know, across all different galaxy types. Um, we see them in high star forming galaxies. We see them um, in globular clusters. We don't see them as much in what we call red and dead galaxies where there's not much star formation going on. But we see them uh, close to the cores of spiral galaxies and also in, in the distant spiral arms. And so the thing I like to tell people is that FRBs in general, we know of about 50 of them that are well localized to galaxies at this point. They're kind of ubiquitous. There's no like one preferred galaxy that, that tends to host FRBs. You might be wondering what the most distant one is so far. That was identified just last year. Uh, it has a redshift of one, for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, that means that it's, um, so the galaxy that it was identified is at a redshift of one, uh, which means that it was emitted when the universe was half of its current size and the pulse has traveled eight billion years to get, to get here. So it's a, um, it's a very distant source and um, it's remarkable to think that this burst was emitted before the Earth and the solar system was formed. <laughs> um, nevertheless, it's, uh, it emits uh, in a few milliseconds what our sun emits in about 16 years. And it's, uh, it's a strong um, reminder of the fact that more FRBs should be detectable farther out in the, in the more, even more distant universe. Here's a picture from the National Science Foundation that shows that you know, one of the 
things that I love about the universe, and I'm sure you do too, is that it's kind of like a time machine. You know, the farther back you see, you look, you see the universe as it was earlier and earlier times. So we're over here and we see, you know, nearby galaxies. But as we, as we start to look uh, further and further into the more distant universe, we see different phases in the universe's evolution. We can go all the way back to the cosmic microwave background and um, have um, compelling models of the Big Bang and, and, and have a pretty good understanding of how the universe evolves. What we're starting to think about now, though, is if we can start to see fast radio bursts out into the more distant universe, then we can use them to study the ionized material in the universe at earlier times. And so we can study what's known as reionization when the stars um, um, ionize the universe uh, for the second time um, after, the, after the first stars were formed. Uh, if, but if we can see fast radio bursts out to those distances. And so that's one of the big, um, the big challenges that's, that's coming up. Um, FRBs are also being used uh, and will be used more and more frequently as a cosmological toolkit. So one of the things that you know is very interesting for astronomers to know is the Hubble constant, which tells us the rate at which the universe is expanding. Hubble's early measurement about 100 years ago was flawed with uh, systematic errors. Uh, so he got he got the wrong answer, but the, the Hubble Space Telescope um, was one of the um, the early uh, or more recent experiments to to get the correct answer of the of, of the Hubble constant. So, um, but there it's been a, a source of uh, intense scrutiny over the years, and you can see that some of the uh, some of the measurements don't necessarily agree with one another. And so there's what's called the Hubble tension, uh, and there's a lot there's a lot of interest in trying to resolve that tension by coming up with different measurements uh, of the Hubble constant that will allow us to um, to probe it in a way that you know doesn't depend on one experiment over over the other. Here's what you can do with FRBs right now. It's about equivalent to what the Hubble telescope could do 20 years ago, or almost 25 years ago. Um, but what's what we expect to see is that FRBs will, as we find more of more and more of them, this uh, this uh, uncertainty in the, the Hubble constant will shrink, uh, and we'll uh, we'll be able to measure it in a way that complements some of these other other techniques. So that's very exciting. <clears throat> um, just looking at the clock here, it's 8:40. Um, so there, you know, there are many things that uh, we're we're looking forward to as as we as we go ahead. Um, we still don't know if all FRBs repeat. Um, if if there are multiple populations, even among the repeaters, that's still an interesting question. Um, and there are, you know, many surprises I think that lie ahead um, as we as we're now starting to look uh, to develop radio technology that allows us to find more and more fast radio bursts. We're able to to look with catalogs in other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and even look for them in uh, as sources of gravitational waves. Um, so that's a very exciting possibility that I think will open up in the coming five to ten years. Um, I'll just mention very briefly here, there are some periodicities in the repeating pulses that are not connected to a rotation of a star, but they're more like a season um, in the sense that every few days a source becomes active and it's, you know, sorry, every, let's say every two weeks a source becomes active, the source is active for a few days and then it turns off. And so probably what's happening is that you've got a, um, a binary type of um, source where you have an energetic object like a neutron star that's plowing into a disk of material uh, once per orbit and you're getting pulses uh, due to that interaction. But there's a lot to be worked out there um, and that, that's a very challenging um, observation to, to do as well. Um, so really all that uh, I want to close by um, is just to say thank you to, uh, to many people. So my collaborators uh, Maura McLaughlin and Matthew Bales, Froni Crawford, Ash Narkovic, uh, the many students that Maura and I have worked with over the years, um, 
both here at WVU and uh, and, and across the world. It's uh, we learn so much from them uh, through this process of research. But none of the research would be possible were it not for the support of sponsors. Uh, here in the U.S., a big sponsor for us is the National Science Foundation. Um, and, uh, you know, it's thanks to your tax dollars um, that uh, make a lot of these experiments possible. Uh, and it's really important for um, promoting science in the future. We're not all going to become astronomers and spend all our time doing astronomy. But what we do here at WVU is we, we bring people in to to study astronomy either at grad school or as undergrads, and then they go off into different careers and use the same skills um, to, uh, to further science in different ways. And so we're playing a, a role in all of that, and that's only possible thanks to your, your contributions as taxpayers. So that's probably a good point for me to stop. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for your time. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, that was very interesting. And I, it's certainly just the beginning, I'm sure, for you all, because there's more and more coming. And it's uh, great to hear how much we're learning in this area. Um, I tell people all the time how much there is going on in the universe that they can't see, even though there are a lot of things to see in the optical universe, but there's a lot more to see otherwise. Uh, do, do we have some questions, Paul? I, 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 I think we do, don't we? Um, not not at this point. Oh, here's okay, actually. Is there oh. any relation between FRBs and gamma ray bursts? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so far, there is not. Um, we think that there there should be um, the and the reason that we think that is because the gamma ray bursts. You know, the energy of, of the gamma ray bursts is so much greater than the fast radio bursts that it's quite possible that the sources don't even know that they're emitting radio waves. It's just a, such a small fraction of their energy, kind of like in the same way that uh, pulsars do. Um, the problem is right now is that most of the gamma ray sources that um, we're detecting are farther away than the radio telescopes can potentially see. And so it's not, we, we haven't conclusively um, uh, made any associations, but people are, are actively looking for those. Chris, you want to go with your question? Yeah, thank you, Paul. So, Duncan, um, you know, first off, thank you very much again. This is fascinating stuff. I was, I was kind of taken by surprise at your uh, slide that showed the history of an FRB of you know, the, the earliest FRB mm -hmm. and your assumption that the, um, you know, that the pulse, all, all frequencies of the, of the pulse in, were emitted at the same time, but they, you know, through dispersion, they've arrived so late. Now, naively, I would have thought that everything traveled across the distance of the universe at the same speed. You know, I the speed right. of light. So clearly, right. you know, I mean, this is why you know I'm I'm an amateur. What what's going on to cause the dispersion? Why I I don't I, yeah. I don't understand that. Well, it's so it's the electrons in so that if if space was just a perfect vacuum, what you said what you said would would be correct that all frequencies would travel at the same speeds, but because there are free electrons, they 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 effect they effectively act. Um, like a screen um, that has a refractive index, and so you know that you know when you when you study refraction, you know in, in optics, um, there's a change in this yes. in the propagation speed. Yep. It's the same thing here. There's a frequency dependent refractive index that's coming from those free electrons. So it's it's very well studied um, from radio pulsars, and so that we we knew that from you know, the very early days, and that's that's allowed people to map out the electrons in the Milky Way. And so what people are now doing is using the, the FRBs to map out the electrons across the, the electrons universe. in the universe, outside the extragalactic yeah. electrons. Yes. Fascinating. Thank you very much. It was a, like I said, I knew it was a naive question. Yeah, no, no. A good question. Looks like George hand up. Uh, Nick Richard has a question. Oh hi, uh, yeah. I was curious with uh, with you mentioning how 
Prime is is able to uh, detect three FRBs per day. Yeah. It, it, is that three new ones or is that three sightings of uh, re repeaters? Um, it's mostly new ones. Um, yeah. So big. And so what? What this to first order? What they're seeing is about ten percent of them are repeats. Um, okay. Yeah. That's that's incredible. Yeah. Cool. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Now, George, go ahead. Um, the energy of these things, is, it's not only that it's enormous, but it's released in such a short time. There's an enormous power involved in this. Now, if it's not a, a supernova and it's not two stars coalescing, um, and it's very localized, what could have, what's the physics really that makes it? I mean, where does that energy come from? Yeah, no, a great question. Um, it's... The, the magnetar flare theory is probably the, the most promising one at this point. And so what you really think there is just the analog of a solar flare. So where you have this, um, um, these, uh, these field lines on the sun releasing energy um, in a short time scale, you know, you basically scale that up to the magnetic field of a neutron star and you release um a significant um significantly larger amount of energy but you can still do that on short time scales um, so that would be magnetic reconnection so i got a flare on a flare the, the theory is that it'd be magnetic reconnection where magnetic the, exactly that that's the word i was searching for yeah they recombine and, and the field has a lower energy than did than it's released okay yeah so, so that's the most promising one right now you know, it's... Yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead, Joselito. Thank you. Dr. Lorimer, uh, you mentioned the microwave oven incident where essentially you guys were managed to pin down <laughs> the microwave, the, the, the energy coming during during noon or during lunchtime. Yes. Uh, now, I'm kind of curious is that, was it when the microwave energy was, it was released from the oven when they popped the door open, or was it a leak around the uh, edges of the microwave that was causing the the spike? Yeah. In it? it was it was the former. It was, it was when you open the door before while the cycle is still running. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. So because I would, well, thought, I would have thought the 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 cabot what 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 would you call a cabotron and the microwave would shut down when 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 you pop open the uh, the door. Yeah, it's it, it. There's there's just enough energy that's being produced. The the magnet's still spinning, um, and it, and it ends up producing something that looks to the telescope okay. just like a pulse. Okay, so as it so essentially, once you pop it, it's still sp it, it is spinning down slowly by still emitting energy when you pop open the door. Yes. So it's not enough to cause harm to a human being, but it's enough to be picked up by the by the right. Yeah, um, it goes okay. straight into the optics of the telescope. Oh, so, okay. Now it makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any more questions? Okay. Looks like uh, we're good on the questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for looking after that. And thank you very much, sir, for being with us tonight. Uh, it was very interesting. I do hope you'll come back and see us in person. I'd love to see them. you as well. And um, I guess we do get out that way, but uh, certainly this is an extre extremely interesting part of astronomy that a lot of people don't think about, but it's certainly going on all around us. Yeah. So thank, you, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Thank you. It's my pleasure.